All right. Well, hello, everyone, and welcome. We've got a very exciting guest on today. We always have exciting guests, don't we, Peter? Um, well, <laughs> well, before we start, oh, well, before we start, uh, I just want to say that uh, my channel is now five years old. Woo! It's our channel birthday, and uh, Peter has been there for me um, all along the way. So thank you immensely for that. And uh, and so now let's turn to our guest. Today we have uh, Dr. William Ratcliffe on. Hello, welcome to the show. Hello, glad to be here. Yeah, so uh, I've been a fan of your work for a little while now. Um, I've let's see, I did a video titled "Experimental Evolution Part One" a while back, where I discussed the uh, sort of ins and outs of your uh, 2012 yeast experiment, which you made the creationists very mad with that one. <laughs> Evolving things in the lab. Uh, <laughs> which I, it's something I, I... We'll get to that um, in more detail a little bit later. But uh, first and foremost, for anyone who's not familiar with you, would you like to talk about your background? Yeah, so my name is Will Ratcliffe. I'm an associate professor of biological sciences at Georgia Tech. And I'm the co-director of our interdisciplinary graduate program in quantitative biosciences, which is a bit of a word salad. Uh, I am an evolutionary biologist who mixes experiments uh, with microbial model systems, with uh, mathematical and computational models. I generally try to ask sort of conceptual questions. And uh, really, it's I, I think our research is idea driven more than, uh, you know, data, data collecting focused. We have, you know, we're trying to ask ask and answer questions that are difficult to address with uh, living organisms and that, you know, th the kinds of experiments that we'll talk about are really well positioned to do. I got my PhD in 2010 at the University of Minnesota, where I did ecology evolution and behavior. Uh, my thesis research was kind of wide ranging. My advisor Ford Dennison was pretty open-minded to like, just let me work on uh, whatever was cool. So I started doing legume rhizobium symbiosis stuff, plant microbe mm -hmm. uh, interactions, what how, you know, essentially what maintains cooperation between these two partners, despite the fact that sort of non-productive cheats exist in nature, mm. how to, turns out plants, actually, I didn't really solve that. Another graduate student solved that problem. turns out plants, plants punish cheats. So my research is, okay, <laughs> if plants punish them, why do they persist, right? Uh, sort of following up on that. I worked on bet hedging. I worked on the evolution of aging. And then oh. I turned my attention to uh, the evolution of multicellularity beginning in the fifth year of my PhD. Uh, I did a postdoc at the University of Minnesota with Mike Travisano, uh, who's the person that I primarily worked on the, the sn snowflake yeast model system of multicellularity with. Going back even further, I was a plant biology undergrad at UC Davis, which uh, I've been a lifelong gardener. I still am very active in my garden. And that was actually what led me, I think, into biology. So plants, so plants were cool, but they were hard to work with. So at first, I was full plants. Then I was plant bacteria. Then I was just bacteria. Then I became just yeast. <laughs> so I've, I've gone more and more and more model system as my career has gone on. Wow. You, so, um, so like symbioses, mm -hmm. um, cheating, mm -hmm. aging, mm -hmm. multicellular. You're just like bed hedging. You're gonna solve everything, I guess. You know, <laughs> all the all the various um, major questions in in evolutionary biology. Yeah, to be fair, we didn't do that much of aging. We had like one, just one pa just one theory paper on that. Um, mm -hmm. But we, you know, I probably wrote half a dozen papers on bed hedging, and that was really fun. Uh, but multicellularity, if I look at the arc of my career, that's definitely been the major topic and the one which we've had the largest contribution to. Yeah, absolutely. I, I am actually, um, I TA uh, the botany labs here at, at um Louisiana State University of Shreveport. And so, awesome. yeah, I, I too enjoy plants from time to time. 
not good at growing them, but like plant systematics is pretty cool. Oh yeah, totally. My little brother is very, very good at natural history. So whenever, and you know, his background is not plants and yet he knows everything about California floristics. It's pretty fun. <laughs> uh. Yeah. Yeah. That is pretty cool. Um, and hello to everyone in the live chat. If you have any questions for, for Will or myself, uh, feel free to put them in there. Um, yeah, I know. I know, Ness. Like, I did say that. Um, I said I wasn't a fan of plants a while back, but they are growing on me. Ha ha. Um, yeah. Um, uh, mm, maybe we'll talk about that. We'll get, we'll talk about sort of that. Um, so your, your first, the, the first experiment of yours I came across was your 2012 paper where you guys, um, evolved, uh, this unicellular Saccharomyces cerevisiae to, into a multicellular phenotype, uh, and generated the, the snowflake yeast. Was that the, was that the first time that that had been done back in 2012? In, in, uh, in yeast. Yes. There was actually one paper from the late nineties where, a uh, guy by the name of Boros co-cultured a single cell alga with a, with a tiny predator. And they evolved mm. to form small groups of cells. And so there was a little bit of work previously in that area. But uh, but mm. this experiment in 2012 was the first time that we'd done it in yeast. And I think the first time that anybody had really sort of broken it down from the sort of evolutionary perspective, like how do groups form? How do groups become Darwinian entities capable of reproduction that have heritable traits that selection can act on those traits and can drive adaptation over time, right? That's... So we, mm -hmm. we dove into the evolution in a pretty unique way. Yeah. And, and, uh, yeah, you guys did a lot to, um, determine conclusively that rather than this being a, like a, a flock type aggregation, this was in fact true clonal multicellularity by like mm -hmm. staining the bud scars and all that sort mm -hmm. of stuff. Yeah. Um, and there was also the very interesting bit that, um, there was the sort of division of labor, which of course is one of the, like the hallmarks of complex multicellularity that mm -hmm. individual cells along the branches would actually like undergo apoptosis. So they'd mm -hmm. form their own new little clusters. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's right. Um, has there been more research on that determining like the genetic underpinnings of that transition? That's a great question. Um, to be honest, no, we have not actually, our group has not focused on program cell death in our system. Mm -hmm. Um, it's definitely something which we routinely see. It's probably one of the most, uh, convergently evolving tr multicellular traits that, that we have in our system. There's two mm. that we just see over and over and over pretty much every time we do the experiment. One is that if we, if we evolve them for a larger size and for, for the listeners out there, our experiment, I'll maybe I'll just kind of say what our experiment yeah, is a little ahead. bit, catch people up. So, you know, we want to understand how multicellular organisms evolve from the very, very earliest steps in this transition. And that can be difficult uh, to do, uh, maybe not to do, it can be difficult to figure out how this occurred in extant lineages like plants, animals, fungi, seaweeds, uh, you know, etc. because those transitions occurred so long ago. We're talking hundreds of millions of years, in some cases, more than a billion years ago. And you don't really have uh, preserved the information about how single cells form groups and how groups evolve to become more complex. Like you just don't have the fossil record resolution, right. et cetera. And, and those transitional things are pretty much gone, except, except for, you know, one clade of green algae, the vulvacine green algae, which we love. Mm -hmm. And so we set out to sort of do these experiments in the lab, taking single cell yeast, uh, baker's yeast, and doing uh, an artificial selection experiment in, in, in the lab where we basically started out with test tubes of single cell yeast. And they grow in a shaking incubator where uh, size doesn't really matter. It's just growth rate that matters. They grow for 24 hours at the end of the day. We put them, we put, take out a subsample, one, one mil out of 10 mils of media comes into a test tube, a small, small test tube. We do a race to the bottom of that test tube, bigger things race down faster under gravity. So they survive, everything else is killed and you rinse and repeat every single day. <laughs> the experiment itself is not very glamorous and you have to come in seven days a week. So it's, it takes a lot of persistence. Um, if you do that though, pretty quickly within a few weeks, you get these cool groups of yeast forming. 
um, and they don't form via sticky, be having sticky cell walls and bumping into each other and aggregating. They actually form via mutations, which cause daughter cells not to separate at the appropriate time during the growth cycle of a cell. And if that happens, then and you have something which buds, then you get this cool tree-like multicellular group forming, where as daughter cells adhere to their mother cells, it's like you you're almost like like a Lego. You're like adding cells to the existing cells and building up this fractal mm. tree tree growth form. And then this thing, it turns out, grows until um, it starts to run out of space and internal cells are being added to a crowded environment and that causes branches to break apart. And if you break a single cell cell connection, it's like sawing a branch off of a tree. That branch floats away into the media and becomes its own separate snowflake. So you get a life cycle totally for free. Like it doesn't have to evolve for a reason. It's a physical consequence of the way that they grow. So they, and you get these cool sort of popcorn like effects. If you look at single cluster and time lapse microscopy, it pops off little babies, which grow back up to its parent size. They pop off their own babies, and you have this exponential growth of, of groups. And um, when when uh, Jackson mentioned that that they have a clonal growth form, we actually know that they're they're pr they're quite highly clonal, and for a very simple reason, uh, which is that you know through this, if you if you have this tree like growth form, right, mutations will occur somewhere in this tree, and then that whole branch downstream is a mutant. And as long and, and because you break off a single cell and that breaks off a, a group, the cell that's the, that at the base of the propagule, the cell that was the one that was broken off from that allowed it to separate from the mother, you know, mothership, that and everything, everything downstream of it is a clone of it because they're just popping off daughter, clonal daughters as they grow. Mm -hmm. So you have these single cell genetic bottlenecks because of the structure of the group. And as you break apart the cluster, Mutations that arise naturally segregate out into different groups. It doesn't necessarily occur in one generation the way it would with us, where we have a single cell in our in our bottleneck in our life cycle, a true single cell. Mm -hmm. But um, it, it, it guarantees segregation pretty quickly. And in practice, it happens. It turns out that based on the parameters of the system, it's anywhere from four to six divisions, and you're pretty much guaranteed a clonal true clonality. So it happens pretty quickly. And so oh, all yeah. of this, I'll just say one more thing. All of this mm -hmm. occurs without selection having optimized these traits for any kind of selective advantage. This is, these are just like, if you have something which buds, you knock out a gene, which causes it to not separate from daughter cells, you'll get this cool fractal tree-like growth form because of three-dimensional packing in physics, this results in uh, a life cycle mm -hmm. that has clonal bottlenecks embedded in it, which is actually very important because that allows mutations to segregate between groups. If those mutations create emergent multicellular traits, now you have this one-to-one -one correspondence between a, a, a group level trait that selection might be acting upon like size of the organism and the genes underlying that trait. And so you now, even without a sort of regulated developmental, ge genetically regulated developmental program, you still have this mechanism of aligning mutations, which provide a repository for heredity with emergent multicellular traits, which is what selection is seeing and acting upon. And you can get Darwinian dynamics arising quite readily at the multicellular level. Sorry if that was a long spiel. No, that no, it, it absolutely that was great. Um, I, and you'll probably have to do the same you know, when we talk about the the recent paper that that just came out. Yeah. <clears throat> um, but yeah, that it you're right. It you know it was a, a fairly simple design, uh, but it produced some absolutely spectacular results. And uh, and there have been um, other uh, experiments as you mentioned. Uh, one with the uh, Boros, uh, like Matt Heron's lab with the the vulvacines. They've done some interesting mm -hmm. stuff with like a uh, Chlamydomonas, mm -hmm. where they, you know, subjected them to pr uh, predators, and they went through a phase where they're like experimenting with all different sorts of sizes, and then they hit on this is the size we need to be to both be able to distribute resources effectively and be too large for the predator, and. Uh, it was, uh, the, I think the coolest thing there was the sheer diversity of different kinds of sort of multicellular group formation that, mm -hmm. uh, that we saw in different, different replicate populations. Yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. It, yeah, it, um, it seems that it's relatively easy to, um, evolve multicellularity. Like it's easier than they thought previously, probably. Definitely. Say that's, yeah, absolutely. When, when we started this work, I think, uh, the assumption was that you know multicellularity has evolved 
numerous times in the history of life, but you know, mm -hmm. not millions, not tens of thousands, you know, dozens, right? So it's a, right. it's a relatively small number, which suggests that it's very difficult, right? And, and we're talking deep time scales, you know, dozens over billions of years. That's, that's not mm -hmm. that often. <laughs> so it sort of suggests, you know, like there's a couple of different ways you could get that. You could have something which is actually quite difficult and therefore just very low probability of occurring. Or you could have something which is actually quite easy, but maybe ecologically impeded from occurring mm -hmm. out of nature. And uh, I think the assumption of the field was that it's pretty hard. And when mm -hmm. we started doing these experiments, we were pretty surprised to show how easy it is. And to me, that really suggests that it's not the, like the potential is really there in lots of different unicellular lineages to evolve, to form multicellular groups. And then for those groups to become sort of, you know, really scaled up through Darwinian evolution and become the organismal units and to have cells evolve to become more and more integrated to sort of lose the ability to grow on their own to evolve uh, division of labor and all these cool traits that make multicellularity a cool thing we care about that mm -hmm. if it didn't do that we wouldn't be talking about multicellularity right we'd be like oh those are just clumps who cares right no we care because they're complex right and i think that potential is really there in a lot of different lineages um and our works i think was some of the first work to really to really show how readily simple lineages can can sort of you know solve these key problems uh that up until then we didn't really know how you'd solve them how do they form groups how do those groups solve problems of, of aligning genetic interests all the cells in the group essentially like, uh, avoiding problems of cheats kind of just disrupting everything mm -hmm. uh, solve problems of like how multicellular traits become heritable so that if you select upon it you can get evolutionary change because if they're not heritable you can select on all day and it doesn't matter you know it doesn't right. actually change it doesn't move the needle um and yeah so this is what we've been doing for a decade <laughs> yeah absolutely um uh, yeah, and you guys did the uh, experiments where you put the the uh, snowflake back in colonies with the unicellular and the snowflakes persisted. So it wasn't just within their little test tube. It was there. They are also um, adaptive, even when in the environment with the, the unicellular one. I thought that was a really cool uh, experiment. Yes, although I'll say you have to do some sort of settling selection. Uh, otherwise, they will eventually lose out because there's yeah. a cost to being in a group. They, they don't have right. as much oxygen and nutrients. There's diffusion problems. And so and this is true, I think, in all multicellular cases that there needs to be an advantage to being in a group because because mm -hmm. we know there's costs. <laughs> right. And and if there's and those advantages really differ depending on the lineage. They're different for photo autotrophs like algae and they're, you know, different different for, for things which are excreting stuff into the environment to, to decompose it, uh, different for things that are avoiding predation. There's lots of different reasons why it might be beneficial to form a group. And so, you know, we do this settling selection thing to basically provide, it's a very experimentally tractable way of providing an advantage to being in a group and being able to select on the size of the group. But we don't actually think necessarily that settling selection is itself the most relevant selective agent for size. Mm -hmm. It's just sort of a proxy for sure. other ones. Yeah. Sure, that that's fair. Um, I don't know if anyone's uh, done it yet, and maybe you're thinking about it, or maybe not. And if not, I would like to um, to put it to you. Have you guys considered? Because you guys did yeast, mm -hmm. and uh, the Heron Lab has done, you know, the the vulva scenes. Uh, has anyone considered doing similar experiments with coenoflagellates? Yeah, we you know we actually started that in collaboration with Nicole King doing a, oh. a oh. Coano experiment evolution project and uh it was going pretty well we had we were about a year year plus into it maybe a year and a half like we had spent a long time troubleshooting it but we were getting them growing and we had some really cool selective this was led by kai tong a phd student in my group mm -hmm. um and then covid19 totally destroyed it so kai went back to china in the fall it, right right i think in december of 2019 right before you know oh. COVID hit and then the borders were closed and he was he just got back to the country uh about a month ago so he was out of the country for almost two years mm -hmm. and during that time you know we had basically kept his coin project uh in minus 80 frozen and uh but we realized you know he wouldn't actually have time to complete it before he needed to graduate and my lab's not really set up to do coanoflagellates. They're they're pretty hard compared to yeast, and we don't have a lot of expertise. Mm. He developed a lot of expertise. He went out to Berkeley a lot to 
to learn from and work with Nicole's group. So mm. we have indefinitely postponed that experiment. Um, I would love to get back to it. I would love to encourage someone who works on Koinos to do it. Um, Cause mm. you know, yeah, they're, they're, yes, I think, but, but more, more broadly experiments in the hollow zones, this lineage yeah. in which the metazones are, you know, nested the animals mm -hmm. and those will be super cool, super exciting. I don't know if you know about Omaya Duden in Switzerland. Not off the top of my head. Omaya Duden, new PI. Uh, he's coming out of Inaki Ruiz Trio's group and he is uh, doing a experimental evolution with an ichthyosporian. Oh, oh, that sounds very interesting. It's okay. really cool. His work is super neat. Um, and I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm really hoping that he's, I think he's, he's very into uh, setting up some sort of long-term evolution experiment. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I think he'll, I think he'll do it. I'm, I'm really excited to see what they see because it has a lot of features, you know, basically these for, for our listeners out there, these unicellular relatives of animals, uh, it turns out have a lot of the same genes that animals have uh, that are used in sort of developmental processes, uh, cell, cell signaling, cell, cell aggregate, you know, cell adhesion, these kinds of things. Uh, a lot of these things already existed before animals evolved. And the unicellular or sort of primarily unicellular, sometimes they have a transient multicellular phase. Mm -hmm. These, these you know, things that are not animals and are separated from animals, they share a common ancestor maybe 800 something year, million years ago. Uh, it would be really cool to see essentially how they're able to sort of, ex you know, the, the thinking is that they had these genes and they kind of repurposed them from right. unicellular processes into multicellular processes. And being able to see some of those things occur in the lab would be fantastic. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, uh, it um, because uh, I just saw someone point uh, Nestle. Yeah, points out uh, there's a good point about the emergent aspects of multicellularity. Um, but yeah, you don't really need. Um, oh yeah, thank you, Peter. Um, yeah, you don't need new information really. It's just yeah, repurposing the stuff that already existed, and that's um, that really has become in evolutionary biology like the big thing. It's you don't need to evolve a whole bunch of different genes. You just duplicate the genes you already have, or just mutate the genes you already have, and this you know changes how uh, structures work or how biochemical pathways operate, things like that. So it's really more about just changing the existing gene set. Yeah, I mean a lot of a lot of what multicellularity is is not inventing uh, new pieces of cells as much mm -hmm. as inventing new ways of regulating what cells are doing what right and so yeah. there's information there that that is added in through darwinian evolution about essentially how developmental processes themselves evolve and pattern formation arises and gets more complicated and stuff but yeah to a large extent we don't think of those as requiring like any kind of new mechanisms or you know not doesn't require major inventions of new mechanisms it mostly requires essentially social evolution of the of the of the of the cells right so yeah co coordination and integration of those cells and and that and that often does involve you know evolving new mechanisms of regulating development and differentiation um but surprisingly small changes uh in the way that cells interact give rise to very cool multicellular patterns it doesn't actually take that much uh to, to sort of you know tweak the way that the, the behavior set of cells conditional behaviors and get emergent multicellular patterns that are that are potentially interesting yeah it was um it was really they uh, the the daughter cells staying together uh instead of doing cytokinesis that was because of of uh, AC, it was ace2 wasn't it was the so gene in our original experiment it was about half of the lines had uh loss of function in in ace2 which yeah. is not at all the same ace2 that's involved in uh covid it's a <laughs> It's it's what uh, COVID it's it's the gene that, that the coronavirus binds to is also called ACE uh, two but they are oh, not okay. the same gene at all they just have the same three letter name uh, four, yeah. uh, four four letter name uh, but they mean totally different things and there's no homology there right yeah yeah absolutely um, but yeah it, it was um, really that change in in ACE two which you know the was it the septum didn't form properly whatever right and so they didn't split. And so instead they all, they stuck together and um, because we mentioned information, uh, have you gotten a lot of messages from creationists uh, because of your mm -hmm. research? No, nah, it's been a handful. Uh, 
but no, I, I can't say that I've received more than a handful of mess direct messages like to me from creationists in my entire career. Mm. Um, You're lucky I, then. <laughs> yeah. I, what's caught me more off guard. If somebody, if somebody were to email me and sort of try to, you know, just put me on blast based on creationist ideas, it'd be fairly easy for me to dismiss. And I wouldn't really be that inclined to engage. Sure. What's been, what's been more surprising is when, when I think someone is doing that, but really what they're asking for is explanation about how evolution works. And my initial response might be to be snarky, but that's not helpful for society. If somebody, if somebody's grown up in a world where they haven't had the opportunity to be exposed to evolutionary ideas and all they've had was creationist ideas, then I really do think it is a responsibility of mine to at least, you know, do a couple emails back and forth, to try sure. to, you know, ass assume good intentions and then see what happens. Sure. Absolutely. Yeah. I, it's, it's just that, um, your research um, and then the research with, with Matt Hare and all this that we've talked about today uh, flies in the face of a lot of their notions about like complexity requires mm -hmm. a lot of new information, mm -hmm. just genes, you know, coming out of your ears, mm -hmm. but really it doesn't. Mm -hmm. And if, if you look at the recent literature, whether with regard to this or the evolution of gene families or what have you, it's mm -hmm. all, repurpose i mean sure they're mm -hmm. there you know you have like de novo genes and things like that but these are relatively minor compared to mm -hmm. um just repurposing existing genes for new functions totally yeah yeah i i wonder i mean i know that there have been a couple of our papers have like ignite ignited sort of you know like fires uh within that mm -hmm. community and uh and started discussion uh but for whatever reason, they leave me out of it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, so that's, that's a good fair. thing. <laughs> I'm not complaining. <laughs> they, um, yeah, they. I think they tend to go after people like, um, like Lensky and uh, Nick Matsky and these other guys who are the big, um, the big science like popularizers are out there mm -hmm. doing these big blog posts about them. And PZ Myers, mm -hmm. um, he's another one. Um, yeah, 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 another Minnesotan. Yeah, He's yeah. At University of Minnesota Morris. Yeah, we uh, we had him on before. Um, nice. nice, fun chat. Uh, so now let's, I guess, change gears. We'll talk about your most recent paper that just came out. Mm -hmm. You guys had a publication uh, just this year. Congratulations! Thank you. Although I'll say it's actually in review right now. It's not out yet. That was the preprint. Oh, okay. I got gotcha. you. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Well, I hope. I hope nothing major changes because I already did a video on it. So, <laughs> uh, I mean, hopefully we'll we'll only be asked to make it a little bit better uh, by referees, <laughs> right? You just, yeah. just add a little more to it. Um, yeah. Um, would you like to explain the process for that one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, this this is a paper that is a long a long standing collaboration uh, between uh, Ozan Bozdag, who's a, a now a research scientist in my group. He was a postdoc and uh, uh, sorry, Peter Yunker's lab, who is a soft matter biophysicist here at Georgia Tech and has been working with us now for a long time on understanding the physics of how multicellular organisms evolve, uh, as well as a number of other people. Um, there's a lot of a lot of co-authors. I, I don't want to go through the entire author list here, but uh, also <laughs> Ali uh, Zamani was a graduate student who's co-advised by Peter and myself, who really played a leading role in some of the biophysical analyses. So I want to make sure I get those three people's uh, leading contributions acknowledged at the start. Mm. So I've always wanted to do a lot, like establish a, a Lensky style, uh, long term, you know, evolution experiment. So mm -hmm. I'm sure all of your listeners know, but you know, Rich Lensky is a founding father of our uh, of experiment evolution, he's got the longest running uh, exp evolution experiment going that's somewhere between 75,000 80,000 generations now and it's led to all these amazing scientific breakthroughs in evolutionary biology. I think without that example, we wouldn't have had the inspiration uh, or confidence to try to do something long term. But I've always thought that while we can sort of do, and we do a lot of this, uh, you know, hypothesis driven specific experiments where we think that there's something is important, maybe we use synthetic biology, maybe we set up just an experiment and we test a, hypo a fairly narrowly defined hypothesis, you know, and it might be something which is developed by mathematical modeling or just conceptual reasoning. I like that style of science, but I don't think that's the only kind of science that's important. And experimental evolution actually provides an alternative way of exploring scientific ideas 
that doesn't require that you that you sort of define what you already know at the outset of the experiment, which in many ways, you know, we love hypothesis driven science. It's a way to be rigorous, but it's also limiting because you have to kind of already know what you're looking for before you start mm. your experiment. <laughs> right. Otherwise you haven't defined your hypotheses clearly enough. And so I've always wanted to push our system through many generations of evolution and see what happens. And uh, for, so, so we, you know, we had this paper 10 years ago, uh, developing the Snowflake Heath model system. I started my own lab um, about a year and a half later at Georgia Tech. And for the first couple, three or four years at Georgia Tech, we tried half year long, you know, maybe up to one year long experiments and our yeast were just plateauing. They weren't really mm -hmm. doing anything. They would get bigger for the first, you know, couple, couple months. And then they would just plateau for a thousand generations. And I was ready to sort of give up on the system thinking that essentially it was uh, intrinsically limited, that you would never get beyond just having simple clusters that resemble mm -hmm. the ancestor in many, in, in pretty much every way. And maybe with tiny variations, but that's about it. Uh, and so Ozan, uh, decided to do these cool experiments looking at the role of oxygen in the evolution of multicellularity. So we had a really nice paper in uh, Nature Communications earlier this year, uh, changing, I think, the way that the field thinks about, at least I hope, this is our intention, the effect of oxygen and the early evolution of multicellularity. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not as simple as we had previously assumed. But not to get off on that tangent. But he had done these We'll talk about that because okay. it was interesting. I saw that paper too. Great, 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 great. Yep. Uh, and, and it turns out that that paper was, is really, it's, that's the sort of stealth first paper of our long-term evolution experiment, <laughs> because <laughs> the, the paper that we have in review right now actually fought, is a continuation of that experiment. Mm -hmm. Um, but we didn't propose it as the LTE because it was just the first, uh, 145 transfers. And so, so it wasn't very long-term yet. Right. And so it turns out though, that, uh, I'll just give the quick summary of this oxygen when very abundant favors the evolution of larger multicellular size. When, when absent, it doesn't hold back the evolution of multicellularity, but when it's present in small levels, it's actually this valuable resource that favors things to get smaller to better use it. Mm -hmm. And so it actually can constrain the evolution of multicellular size and thus complexity because size and complexity are kind of intimately tied together. And so um, we, we think of it as a sort of Nike swoosh curve that with no oxygen, you get big, you add a little bit of oxygen, it actually pushes things to be a lot smaller. You add mm. more oxygen, they can get bigger again. So he did this experiment, launched this experiment with our snowflake yeast doing the settling selection that I mentioned before, selecting for fast sinking through liquid media with no oxygen and high, no oxygen, little, low oxygen, high oxygen. And that's the thing which actually really began to change the chain where we began to get like big and exciting changes in our yeast model system. Uh, mm. So this paper that that's, that's, uh, that's in review right now. Uh, we report the, for the first time the evolution of macroscopic multicellularity in our system. So we take them through, we report the first 600 transfers. So 600 daily daily transfers with settling selection, uh, which is probably on the order of about 3,000 generations. And what we see there is something that's pretty cool. During this time, we, we have five populations that, that can't use oxygen, and those are the stars of the story. Uh, mm -hmm. They're the ones that get a lot bigger. So over this time, they get about 20,000 times bigger than the ancestor which takes them from being far too small to see with the naked eye, hundred cells up to half a million cells, you know, bigger than a fruit fly easily seen by the naked eye. These mm -hmm. things are huge. And, um, <laughs> to do this, they actually have to change the way that the cells interact biophysically because otherwise they don't have the strength and toughness to get large. Something that we don't typically think about the evolution of multicellularity is actually the sort of physics and materials property sides of things, which is, Early on, you get these groups of cells. They don't have any evolutionary history of being a multicellular group. And if you and if there's a you know if if they're selectively uh, if they're under selection for larger size, that actually means that you're also putting them under selection for tougher materials properties. So the early and and, and and these usually simple multicellular groups they're not very good in terms of their multicellular materials properties because they don't have any history of selection acting on these kinds of link scales. Selection right. is acted on cell level link scales. All of a sudden, you have things that are you know, experiencing stresses over much greater length scales that they have no history of. So they break, they're not good at it. Right. And so collaborating Peter was key to sort of unraveling the physics of how our snowflake yeast evolved to become tough. So actually I'll, I'll give you the, 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 the end of this, which is that over this 600 uh, transfers, they go from being 100 times weaker than gelatin, 
really a terrible material. If, if you look at a classic materials uh, chart of, of strength and toughness, two different axes of, of material properties, they are actually off the chart <laughs> bad. They're so bad because if you break any single cell cell connection, you break the whole group. And so it's it's like ma it's classic materials like uh, like wood, the toughness of the material is the same, but the strength of the material depends on its size. Toughness is basically like you divide by volume. So, so you kind of average out how size it. So a toothpick is just as tough as a two by four, right? It's just a two by four is stronger because there's a lot more material. Sure. And with that bigger material, you get a lot more cell cell bonds and therefore you have to break a lot more cell cell bonds to break the two by four, right? Mm -hmm. uh, our thing was very, very bad because no matter how big you got it, if you broke one cell cell connection, you, you popped off a propagule. <laughs> So it's right. a uniquely bad material in terms of its materials properties. And so when we look, when we look at our snowflake yeast, uh, they go from a hundred times weaker than gelatin to being as tough and strong as wood, which is roughly 10,000 times tougher. It's mm -hmm. just a huge increase in, in toughness. They, so they become, they're material savants. They're a, Dar a Darwinian material, right? How do they evolve to be so much tougher? So we figured this out. Um, the first thing that all of our snowflake yeast do as they're evolving to get bigger is they get more and more elongate cells. Now, if you imagine this, uh, here, I'm just trying to find my video. <laughs> all right, cool. It's funny. It's funny. It's, the, the, the feed I'm looking at has me backwards uh, relative to a mirror. So <laughs> it, it, imagine that you're building a snowflake yeast. You're like packing ping pong balls. And you're adding every time a cell divides, you add a new ping pong ball, right? And so, you know, if, if you're doing that, you can imagine that your ping pong ball structure here gets jammed up and there's no place to put ping pong balls pretty fast. And when that jamming occurs, that's what causes it to break. Do the same thing, though, and use a hot dog instead. If you make the cell more elongate, we call that a high aspect ratio, the length divided by the width. If you, if you make the cell more elongate, the whole thing gets more fluffy. There's a lot more open space around these mm -hmm. cells. And that actually means that you have a lot more room for error and room where branches can move before they jam and break apart when you add a cell. So the most consistent trait that we see evolving in our experiments, and we've done this now in many dozens of independently evolving populations over, over years is they get more long, they get mutations, which give them more and more, more and more elongate cells. So over the whole course of this 600 day selection experiment, our yeast cells get longer and longer and longer. And that makes the groups bigger and bigger and bigger before they fracture, but it doesn't give you a huge increase. We're talking a relatively mild slope here, you know, they make you know, eight times bigger or something by having, you know, hot dog shaped cells, uh, instead of nearly spherical cells, but we're not talking macroscopic snowflake yeast. Mm -hmm. So they're all getting more and more elongate cells. And then all of a sudden, two of these five populations just jump to being huge, you know, a hundred fold increase in size all at, all at once. Whoa, that's pretty crazy. And then about, you know, a thousand generations later, the other three catch up and do the exact same thing. And so when we look at the way that our cells are interacting inside the groups, normally by having more and more elongate cells, they should be getting fluffier and fluffier and thus less and less dense. That is cells should make up a lower and lower amount of the uh, volume of the cluster. Mm -hmm. And that's in fact true. We, we can model this with a three-dimensional biophysical model. We can map our cells onto it and they line perfectly up even though they're not actually fit to each other. I love, I love this kind of modeling. Um, and what we see experimentally though is that that the model predicts that the more elongate cells are, then basically the less dense our groups should be. But if we if we look at the experiment initially, as you make the cells more elongate, they are going correspondingly less dense. But then all of a sudden, they begin to get more and more and more dense until they're actually packing very densely, much more densely than even the ancestor was, which doesn't mm. make a lot of sense. <laughs> so we we tried to image our yeast to understand if something about the way that cells were arranged was responsible for this. We were really interested in the topology and the geometry of the cells within these, within these half a million cell clusters. But if you try and do this on any kind of normal light microscope, it doesn't work. You can't look very deeply into a cluster because the light is going in and out of cells and that's causing light to scatter. So you mm -hmm. just can't image more than a couple cell layers deep, even with really, really fancy million dollar microscopes. Uh, we tried all of them. We tried light sheet. We tried confocal. We tried two photon. We tried all this fancy stuff and got cool pictures, uh, cool videos. If you want to throw in the show notes, a link to that Twitter thread where I described the preprint, a lot of those videos and images, those come from these fancy microscope techniques, but you can't look very deeply. So Ali took our yeast, uh, to university of, uh, Illinois 
Urbana Champagne, where they have this fancy kind of a scanning electron microscope where you mount your cluster in a block of resin and it has a, a microtome with a diamond blade that can cut like extraordinarily thin slices through your cluster. We're talking 50 nanometers, right? That's a tenth the wavelength of a, of a photon of, you know, green light. Mm -hmm. So we, we can do thousands of 50 nanometer sections and image each one of those uh, with an electron microscope so we can get through the entire cluster. And then we have this problem where we had so much data of these two dimensional images from the from the scanning electron microscope that they couldn't even send it to us electronically. They had to like literally ship hard drives because it was many, many <laughs> terabytes and the bandwidth of shipping something in FedEx is much higher than it turns out the internet <laughs> if, you have, if you have enough terabytes. Uh, and so we had these huge imaging data sets that we had to, to deal with and uh, there wasn't good like off the shelf software to do it. So we ended up actually basically coding all of this in Python from scratch. Oh, wow. Uh, image our stuff basically just as a stack of three dimensional uh, matrices where each matrix was like a, a, a you know, just a, a grayscale pixel value for every pixel in an image stacked on top of each other. and. You know, you get enough of those and that's your big three-dimensional thing. And then you can slice it and all, do all the image analysis you want on the raw data, which Ali was extraordinarily good at. Uh, it, that was a really hard problem, <laughs> but he solved it uh, with, with help from Eva wow. Dyer, uh, who's uh, in, in biomedical engineering and does a lot of work like that. Uh, professor in biomedical engineering here at Georgia Tech. So long story short. Initially, every cell is basically like a branch on a tree that they're basically they're all going off into their own space. And if you clip a cell, a branch, then it floats away because it's, it's not it's not it's not tangled up in the tree. Mm -hmm. But once we got what well, we had a couple of changes that were important, primarily the cells got long enough and we actually think they began to change the angle at which they bud somewhat. And that resulted in uh, in, in, in this entanglement phenotype where the cells now rather than being these branches that just got into their own space the mm -hmm. cells are wrapped around each other and we can actually we can quantify that entanglement using uh this cool convex hull analysis where we fit uh, a, a small the smallest possible free volume uh you know polygon around each each uh cell and ask is another cell like in that space and if they are they're entangled we can percolate that entanglement throughout our our, our cluster and we can basically show that the vast majority like 93 percent of the cells in our clusters are all wrapped up in this entangled component. So now if you want to break this thing apart, it's not breaking a single cell cell connection. You have to rip through hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of cell cell connections. Mm -hmm. and that actually makes the material property of the group. It makes, that's what makes it strong. That's what takes mm -hmm. it from going worse than gelatin to as strong as wood. Oh yeah. Yeah. It, yeah. That was absolutely fascinating. It was really interesting to read the paper and, um, uh, and I think, in my opinion, in addition to the, um, it is really cool that they got, w you know, way big. Um, mm -hmm. Actually, we did have a question from uh, Neslig on that. Uh, would you consider this an example of punctuated equilibrium? Uh, yeah, I suppose. Uh, yeah. We actually, if you look at figure, uh, figure two from the paper, uh, I think, uh, you, what you see is that, in fact, there is initial increase in size of about, mm -hmm. I think, fourfold. And then all five of our populations, are they're, they're evolving in an incredibly, uh, you know, parallel manner. They all basically get the same size increase. And then they just plateau for a mm -hmm. while, like almost a thousand generations. And then some of them blast out of that and get entanglement and get really big. And the others wait another thousand generations. And then they blast out of that and get entanglement and get, you know, orders of magnitude larger. Mm -hmm. So it is very much in the sort of Gouldian punctuated equilibrium style where there's periods of stasis followed by rapid adaptation. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, um, the, the paper, the, the first, the, the stealth print, um, I was not aware of that, uh, research because, um, was more familiar with like uh you know oxygen's always uh considered like the the mechanism for size increases whether it's like the mm -hmm. ediacaran to the cambrian or the mm -hmm. the giant carboniferous insects or what have you sure um, yeah. and so i thought it was very interesting that at low levels it can actually hamper the yes. uh, evolution of multicellularity that was very interesting yeah you, maybe i can explain that a little more yeah, sure. So, so that's a great introduction that we, we I think the field has long thought that basically there was a, 
a monotonic relationship between oxygen concentrations in the, in the air and in the water and the size to which organisms can grow. And this makes sense if, uh, if you make a few simple assumptions <laughs> and it's one of the assumptions mm -hmm. is that basically cells have to have oxygen to, to, to grow and it, that you can't basically have an organism that has an anoxic zone because those cells will die. And that sets an upper bound to the size to which the organism can grow. And mm -hmm. as you get more and more oxygen in the atmosphere or water, it diffuses further to the organism. And so you just have this little, you know, you just have a little tuner that as you crank up oxygen, things can get bigger and bigger because O2 can diffuse further. And if mm -hmm. that's all true, then yes, I think oxygen basically is just this one-way lever towards increased size. But it turns out that not all organisms <laughs> are obligately aerobic. And in fact, the ancestor of eukaryotes uh, is, is facultatively aerobic. So it's called a mixotrope. Mm -hmm. And there's actually very good ecology and evolutionary, re ecology and evolutionary reasons for this, uh, which is that if you're on an environment, like, so I'll just re recapitulate the evolution of the, the history of oxygen on Earth. About 2.1 years do. ago, we had uh -huh. the quote unquote great oxidation event. Mm -hmm. it's not really an event. It took place over more than 100 million years. Right. An event to a geologist. Not so much. <laughs> <to me. laughs> yeah. And blink then, of an uh, eye, you know. Yeah, blink exactly. All of a sudden, we have it's it's great, <laughs> <laughs> and it, and we go from basically an anaerobic world to one where we had maybe one percent of modern levels, mm -hmm. and then we had what geologists call the boring billion, which I love, right. where from two two billion years to one billion years, there isn't that much happening in terms of the types of cell uh, types of biology that fossilizes. I'm sure there's tons of cool evolution happening, but sure, it's all microbial. <laughs> Origin of, of, yeah, of uh, like Uniconta and Biconta and all those different exactly. groups. Yeah. And, you know, crying group eukaryotes uh, evolved around 2 billion years ago. And so, you know, these guys are mixotrophic. They can use oxygen when it's present, but they don't need it, which makes sense on a world where oxygen is like fairly limiting, right? Mm -hmm. You can imagine that if you're at 1% levels and then you just go into the mud a little bit, it's like zero. Right. <laughs> it doesn't take much to absorb it all. And, uh, so then we basically have low oxygen until the Phanerozoic, which is like 540 million years ago. And then it really blasts up pretty quickly. That's really a pretty great increase. Uh, maybe a better candidate for the great oxidation event name. Uh, <laughs> it blasts up to modern levels very quickly. And then, you know, multicellularity really flowers in many lineages uh, in the last 500 million years. Mm -hmm. uh, animals, plants, etc. Okay, so... So if you relax the assumption that every cell needs oxygen to be able to survive, then now all of a sudden, rather than saying size is purely dictated by the physiology of how far oxygen can diffuse, it's now a question of evolution. You can say, all right, well, what size organism would selection favor if oxygen is available and mm -hmm. provides a huge resource payoff, but maybe there's not that much of it around, right? So oxygen, you can th if you think of, start thinking of oxygen less as just a part of the environment, and actually more as a resource. If you can get oxygen, then you can get up to 18 times more ATP per glucose. If you can get oxygen, then you can break apart carbon that's not fermentable. You can respire it and still get energy from it. So it's sort of a cofactor in food. If you start to think of it more as a resource and that you have these multicellular groups and when oxygen's limiting, it can't diffuse very far. Those internal cells might just be happy to, to sit around. They're not necessarily dead. That doesn't provide a limitation on the size of the organism. But if you have this group of cells and oxygen's only going to the very outer, outer ones, then all the internal cells are just sitting there, spinning their wheels, unable to use that oxygen. Maybe they're fermenting, maybe they're doing normal growth under fermentation, but they're missing out on, on the benefits of oxygen. And so as soon as you go from a world where there's no oxygen, where you know selection is just acting on the size of this of this anaerobic group and assuming that bigger size is better and we make that assumption because if you don't nothing ever evolves to be multicellular they all stay single celled assuming mm -hmm. the bigger size is better then in an anaerobic world they're just free to get big you add a little bit of oxygen and now all of a sudden small things every cell is getting oxygen big things only the only maybe a small percentage the very on the very outer side right they're getting the oxygen so they're actually paying this opportunity cost they, mm -hmm. they would I'd do better to get smaller and, and grow a lot more, even if they're even if there's some selection against selection acting on them at the multicellular level, that they don't have the benefit of size, but they have this benefit of greater growth rates. If you increase the oxygen such that it diffuses a long distance into this big group, well, now it gets the benefit of size and it doesn't really pay much of an opportunity cost. Every cell is getting the oxygen and you're free to get big again. 
Mm. there's other reasons why oxygen probably sort of interacts with multicellularity down the road. But initially, in these like, you know, early times, it seems like limiting oxygen, like low amounts of oxygen, really provide this evolutionary constraint that it provides an incentive for these things to get small so that the smaller groups can more efficiently utilize oxygen. And so if you go from a world that's anaerobic to one that's microaerobic, that actually kind of hits the brakes on multicellularity in a way that you wouldn't have been if you just let them stay anaerobic. And it's kind of not released until you crank up oxygen levels towards higher levels where it can diffuse further. Yeah, absolutely. That is that is very interesting research. Yeah, so just to, to say we did this in yeast and we actually demonstrated all the things that I kind of described yeah. conceptually, we show in our, in our yeast model system that in fact, if you evolve snowflake yeast under no oxygen, low oxygen, high oxygen, you get big size and no oxygen, big size and high oxygen, and they don't really evolve to get much bigger in low oxygen. Mm -hmm. And then we actually did some cool synthetic biology to show that this is really due to selection acting on the fitness consequences of size under these mm -hmm. different oxygen environments. Like we engineered, we sequenced our evolved yeast, found the genes that affect size, engineered otherwise genetically identical yeast that were big and small and competed them against each other under low and high oxygen. And under low oxygen, the smalls win, under high oxygen, the big, bigs win. Under no oxygen, the bigs win. So we can really recapitulate the same dynamics that we see in experimental evolution. Uh, yeah. Nice. I, I do love that uh, as you guys uh, looked at the, the genomes to see which genes were involved in, uh, in multicellularity. Were there any big um, surprises with regard to that? Or was it a lot of the same sort of stuff that you'd seen in earlier experiments? So, so far, the stuff that we published, I'd say, is fairly unsurprising. Not that mm -hmm. we've seen it in prior experiments so much, uh, but that it just makes sense for yeast to do it this sure. way. Sure, sure. If they're going to evolve to have cells that are, you know, instead of being spherical, like look more like a hot dog, right? Well, there's some well-known pathways to get you there. Things that affect the cell cycle, things that affect pseudohypal growth. And, you know, we're seeing mutations in those pathways. It makes perfect sense. Um, mm -hmm. but the stuff that I'm actually really excited about is, uh, is work that we're doing in collaboration with Juha Sarekengas's lab in, in Finland, really looking at the cell biology of some of these traits in, in, and it turns out that it's far more complicated and fascinating than just mutations that are, they give you loss of function. Mm -hmm. We're seeing changes in large scale cellular behavior due to changes in chaperone proteins things that basically affect the whole proteome mm. by affecting protein stability that act in an age dependent manner. So older cells are behaving differently than younger cells. And that's evolved in the context oh. of our yeast. And, and this is actually a way of generating spatial heterogeneity that old cells are in the middle, young cells on the outside. So you can mm -hmm. actually use aging as a tool for driving cellular differentiation. And our work is basically showing how changes in evolved age dependent behavior underlie entanglement and these these phenotypes uh we're still a, kind of a distance away from really nailing all of the molecular biology here it's it's a huge project mm -hmm. we've been working on it for three years already and uh and there's a, there's a it's it's a huge amount of uh <laughs> covid certainly doesn't help with anything yeah <laughs> yeah yeah but it's going to be really cool i think to begin to elucidate the molecular mechanisms through which um developmental processes arise and it's not just every cell is more elongate or every cell has this, this shape and behavior, but are we getting basically developmental processes, location and space to right. is a yeah. phenotype that are recapitulated every life cycle. And to me, that will be some of the most exciting work that we could possibly do. You've got this, this sort of group ontogeny going on now, rather than just right. yeah, a right. single cell ontogeny. And that's, that is very fascinating. That's exactly right. And, you know, our, our yeast don't have a lot of the things that that standard developmental processes use cell cell communication that we know of uh, mm -hmm. morphogen gradients in which cells have a specific right. behavior tied to these things. Like they don't have all those tools of developmental biology, but neither did any nascent multicellular lineage, right? These are those right. things are inventions of multicellular organisms. And so it'll be really cool to see how they kind of bootstrap developmental processes from the things that they have at their disposal, which actually ties back to what you said earlier, which is that evolution is the master tinkerer, right? There's not so much invention of new things, whole cloth. It's repurposing things that you already had for novel use. And it's going to be really cool to see how they do that for developmental processes as well. Yeah. I um, it, It's been a while now, but I, I was reading papers about um, 
different genes involved in the switch between like um as we, we mentioned like ichthyosporians earlier and they can like switch i believe it's ichthyosporians between their like they have a flagellate stage and yeah. like an amoeboid stage and they can that's right kind of go back and forth between those yes Yes, so Inaki Reese Trio's group has been really at the forefront of showing that, um, and yeah, exactly. So, so there, there, that provides this raw material for phenotypic uh, plasticity that just needs to be sort of controlled and regulated to give you morphological complexity. Yeah, yep. And then it's it's just up from there. I am. I really do hope you guys get. Uh, back to the uh, coenoflagellate stuff at some point or someone does because I, I really do look forward to reading the paper like we got a sort of sponge looking critter here yeah. that was one <laughs> of the, that was one of the treatments that we were trying to do was was uh you know we were doing settling selection but we were also doing something where we adhered them to a the bottom of a of a culture of flask with the, with the hope of getting polarity and you know mm -hmm. yeah yeah absolutely yeah i mean that would be fantastic i've yeah, it would be so cool. To that. Koenas are hard. Uh, hats off to Nicole's group, Nicole King's group, for, mm -hmm. for, for working with them. They are, compared to yeast, they are really hard. <laughs> I'm very spoiled. Um, yeah. You know, oh, yeah, some other crazy stuff that your uh, listeners might enjoy hearing about. Like, for example, you know, one of these things with oxygen, right, is that uh, oxygen is this constraint, right? So, so what do modern organisms do to get around that? Well, they invent circulatory systems. Okay, but we're not going to do that. That's that's too hard. Uh, but, <laughs> but another thing that they do is they invent oxygen binding molecules that increase not the amount of oxygen held in the system, but the diffusion rate of oxygen through the system. Mm -hmm. So you're, you've probably heard of hemoglobin and myoglobin, right? Those are yeah. O2 binding proteins that increase diffusion rates of oxygen. Mm -hmm. So we actually engineered snowflake yeast to make myoglobin from a sperm whale and a related oxygen binding uh, compound called myohemorrhythmin from a peanut worm. And in fact, we have them expressing the, the, an the ancestral protein that was the progenitor of the split between hemoglobin and myoglobin, which we actually just took from one of Joe Thornton's papers. And uh, you, can, you can basically just bespoke create your own genes. For $1,000, you can just have a company make your genes, stick it in a plasmid, then you can just stick it into yeast and when yeah. we do this, our yeast, they, they're pink. Like, they actually look... <laughs> they are <laughs> Really? Yeah, because yeah, they're expressing so much myoglobin that they're pink. And so now we're actually looking at how um, ex like expressing O2 binding proteins affects the evolution of size, right? What are the feedbacks there? Does it get you... Does it basically get you over this uh, O2 dependent limitation that, like, we previously saw this Nike swoosh where a little bit of oxygen keeps them small. Well, mm -hmm. how, does that, how does that relationship change once they can move oxygen through their tissues much faster sure yeah, yeah absolutely so one of the one of the beautiful things about yeast is that you can do all this synthetic biology wizardry right where you you know like hey why don't why don't we try this thing <laughs> so that's that's work that's being led by yeah. tony bernetti who's a fantastic postdoc in our group um he's doing a lot of other synthetic biology witchcraft we'll see if how much of it works <laughs> witchcraft i like it um are there any other um, experiments you want to mention uh, or or topics you want to broach? I think that's the main stuff. Uh, I'll say okay. one other thing you can keep a, keep an eye out for is Peter Conlin, who's a postdoc in our group, is okay. working on how adaptation in snowflakes limits their ability to revert back to being a single-celled organism. Turns out that if you look at these different major hmm. evolutionary transitions, like multicellularity, like there aren't any single cell descendants of animals like running around nature, right? right? Like you have all these animals, but there's no single cell protists that have an animal ancestor, right? That right. we know, of, that we know. Of. And so there seems to be sort of and same for plants, right? There seems to be this kind of directionality. It's not, mm. it's not universal. Fungi go back and forth all the time, but um, but a lot of these lineages seem to get kind of entrenched. Um, that once they once they make this step up in in, in sort of organismality, individuality, they have a hard time stepping back down. And another mm -hmm. way of thinking about it is that this entrenchment actually tells you something about what's the organism. If if single cells can't survive on their own, then it's pretty hard to make an argument that they're that they're organismal, right? Like, and so how mm -hmm. does this process of Darwinian evolution acting at the multicellular level drive entrenchment at the new multicellular level? So Peter's work is actually showing so far that like 
we do see the fitness of unicellular. We can we can take our snowflake yeast and bring it back to unicellularity by repairing that ACE2 gene. Mm -hmm. And some lineages, as you can basically get them all to revert, and at a certain point that stops working. Like you put ACE2 back in, and it doesn't make them go back to single cells. So that so there's mutational huh. limitations that you know they, the cells essentially are getting more more entrenched because you can't bring them back just by fixing ACE2. Other things are changing too. Right. And then even if we are able to get them back, uh, the types of mutations that are occurring in that multicellular context often really reduce growth rates. And so we're actually seeing the fitness of free living single cells go down as a function of multicellular adaptation, uh, which, is, which Interesting. is really cool, right? Because it really yeah. shows that like cells are becoming these integrated parts, groups of the organism. We're seeing them get more complex. We're seeing cells be stripped of their evolutionary autonomy. Yeah. That is very interesting. Yes. That is pretty neat. Yeah. Okay. I look forward to, to uh, reading more about that too. That is really cool. Yeah. It'll be fun to get those papers at. They have it's their, um, yeah. their uh, sort of phylogenetic bottlenecks, I guess, or uh, their, their limits. Yeah. And so this they, is, I think it's a real virtue. This is one of the things that having a long-term experiment in your lab is, is uh, unlocks, right? Is like, you could have tested these ideas in a 60 day selection experiment or a hundred day selection experiment, or you can go to the, the sacred timeline, the, the one big experiment that's been running for a thousand transfers, right? You yeah. can go to that and you can, you can pull isolates and, and, you know, really look at a large amount of time. And, uh, and that'll even just, that'll just get better and better as we go through more generations. Oh yeah. Yeah. I'm really glad um, that you guys have done this long-term um, experiment. I, I hope that, uh, more labs in the future also try for that that sort of long term stuff because with with the uh, with Lensky, you know, for instance, they're still getting uh you know returns on on their long term E. coli experiment. They're still putting definitely. out papers and stuff. Oh, definitely, uh, definitely. they I mean, uh, every every paper they publish is like a must read. Like, oh, what's the latest? <laughs> Got to check that out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. they um, it's like the um, the cells like. I think they got larger too. They were, um, of course, Much the, larger. Yeah. the big one was the the CIT plus um, mutation, which is also fascinating. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's been a lot, you know, showing that fitness that basically you have indefinite increases in fitness, but it slows down this power law function. Right. Uh, looking at sort of the genomics, parallel evolution, uh, history and contingency. Uh, there's been some coexistence stuff between uh, acetate consumers and glucose consumers. There's been a lot of really cool stuff coming out of the, their, their lab. Speciation, I think that's one thing that they're kind of working on right now is like incipient speciation in, in, their, uh, in their E. coli system. I don't know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a species skeptic. Uh. <laughs> yeah, I, mean, it, it, I think the, my approach to that term is that it's a, it's a, it, can, it can be a useful term, yes, but we're yeah. never going to agree on a universal definition and should, shouldn't right. really, should, I don't think we necessarily need to try. I think we should acknowledge that it's a heuristic, acknowledge that there's certain right. species concepts that work better for other systems. Use the one that works well for your system and stop arguing so much about the universal definition that may or may not even exist. Right. Yeah. I mean, with, <clears throat> with, you know, bacteria, if, if they have a different ecology, then you might as well call them you know, a new species and yeah. And uh, I, I do feel that. So if we're going with that sort of heuristic, then yeah, I would definitely say there has already been sort of a speciation with their, uh, their CIT plus mutants. Yeah, that's right. And you, if you imagine that there were gene flow acting between those different lineages, my guess is that the intermediate forms would be pretty bad, right? Because you have these two different metabolisms specialized on different resources. And if they were to exchange genetic information through horizontal gene transfers, say, you know, that might be really maladapted, right? Those genes mm -hmm. would be like, they're very used to their specific genetic background. And all of a sudden moving between the different lineages is, is costly, which right. would not have been the case in the beginning, right? So one of the cool things about speciation is that it's this lack of gene flow that allows for divergence to occur. And to me, that's the fundamental idea of speciation and yep. drawing a bright line. That's, we get into trouble when we just try to draw, when we try and draw a bright line. <laughs> on a continuous yeah. process, right? Absolutely. <laughs> get into trouble. <laughs> I love um, yeah. bringing up the, the, the Incitina salamander example because that mm. one's just beautiful with... Uh, Is that a ring species? 
Yes, yeah, it's mm-hmm. it's uh, the California uh, salamanders, and so they go around mm-hmm. the central, uh, like Central Valley. Like, yeah, Central Valley in um, yeah. in California, and so you know you have this this divergence, and you got the non splotched and the splotched forms, and then mm-hmm. they meet back on the other side Mm -hmm. and there's like next to no um uh, hybridization between them they are Mm. pretty Mm -hmm. well separated that's very Uh, cool and i'm a big uh cichlid fan and Mm. so yeah uh you have like uh, lake victoria lake malawi lake uh, tanganyika and they all have these huge cichlid populations which you know they're like reef filling and then they're drying out and so you get these little population bottlenecks and it refills and suddenly there's a new adaptive radiation. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, and that's why, yeah, species, uh, subspecies, all that sort of stuff. Mm-hmm. That's, mm-hmm. I don't know. I don't know how to feel about when people say things like, oh, this is a new subspecies of whatever. It's like, is it, are they interbreeding or not? Is it a new species or isn't it? You know? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think that in, the gene, gene flow is kind of fundamental, I think. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, the biological species concept is, I, th- I think it's super flawed. <laughs> yeah. It, yeah. It attempts to, it, again, it just, it's because everyone attempts, if you have a continuous process, if you, and you decide I'm going to make a rule where I draw a bright line. And if you're on one side of this versus the other side, you have different things, but the process is itself fundamentally continuous. then you're always going to have problems with that definition. I think because yeah. right. Yeah. It's I agree. Like, um, you know, I, I'm, I would turn 21 tomorrow. Can I have a beer? No, if you do, that's illegal. You'll get a fine. Oh, it's it's now 12 o'clock. Oh, it's perfectly legal. You're responsible. You're mature enough to do this. That doesn't right. make sense, right? Because it's a continuous process and we've drawn a bright line. Speciation is kind of the same thing. You have divergence due to lack of gene flow. And initially, those differences are small. Uh, they get bigger and bigger through time, generally speaking. Uh, depending right. on how well resolved your data set is, you will draw that line in different places, right? <laughs> if you have a super high resolution data set, you can find small monophyletic groups that have diverged recently and show, oh yeah, those things are separate because look, I can show there hasn't been interbreeding over this very short time scale. If right. you have lower resolution data, you're going to find much broader monophyletic groups in which there wasn't gene flow. So, I mean, I, I see the, pro- I, I like talking about speciation in terms of the process, but if people, but, and, and I'm, and I'm charitable when people draw their own lines, uh, yeah. but just, you know, as long as they're not too hardcore that like they're absolutists, that this is the right way to do it. And every other way is wrong. I, uh, I'm less charitable towards that approach. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I absolutely agree with, with that. Um, yeah, actually, the next video. So I'm doing this series. Have you ever read The Ancestor's Tale by Richard Dawkins? Uh, yeah, a long time ago. Um, I'm doing a series where we look at each of the tales and oh, talk cool. about um, what are the more recent developments in this field? What did they talk about? And blah, blah, blah. And so we're going through each one, all like 60 of them. <laughs> I think we're on like six now. I read it back in grad school, and I think I recall being very jazzed that there was a legume rhizobium symbiosis tale. There is, yep, yep, the the <laughs> rhizobium's tale. That's like the second to last one in our series, I think. Gotcha. So we got a little ways to get there. Nice. Uh, is there a multicellularity one? Not, no, I don't. Well, oh. uh, sort of. He sort of talks about. He has a coenoflagellates tale where he mm-hmm. sort of touches it. But then he doesn't have another tail until he jumps all the way down to uh, to plants. Mm, so gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, he's. I mean, he's. Yeah, I don't know. He's. He's. I can't think of really any other books he's written where he talks about multicellularity in any great depth. I don't think that's really his his wheelhouse. Yeah, and honestly, there's been a lot of development in the field in the last ten years. Yeah, um, a huge amount, right? Both, I think, from the understanding how things like animals have evolved by greater understanding of the hollow zones that's completely changed in the last 15 years mm-hmm. and a lot in the last 10 years. And then, you know, experimental evolution type stuff where we can really see Darwinian dynamics playing out and understand how these things actually kind of work dynamically rather than just historically, which is to me, like, that's my whole bread and butter. I love that stuff. Uh, but yeah, a lot has changed in the last 10, 15 years. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You're, you're right. And, um, I think it was it was earlier this year. There was actually did you see the paper about the 
the holozoan that was the fossil that was discovered oh are you talking about that proto sponge uh that was like sitting on photosynthetic uh cyanobacterial mats and had is that is that the one no but that does sound like an interesting paper uh oh yeah okay uh this it was Oh, I can't remember the genus name. The species is, they named it after um, uh, Brazier. Hmm. Uh, it's like, oh man, I can't remember the name. But uh, the, the paper, it's like a putative holozoan. So there's actually, they found this like microscopic uh, fossil with like cell differentiation. And it, it, it looks fairly familiar. I'll have to look back through my notes. That does sound like something that I vaguely recall reading. <laughs> this whole but, year has been last two years are really a blur. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Oof, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, the hope is that uh, I had a I had a um, guy who's an uh, epidemiologist on. I guess that was last year. Oof, uh, and uh, yeah, we talked about all the fun nutty stuff going on right now. And he was optimistic about the future. Um, and I hope his optimism wasn't misplaced. So. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Um, I mean, the RNA vaccines are super good. So that's pretty exciting. Yeah. Well, that, that doesn't, uh, that doesn't exactly convince everyone. Sadly, not so. by a long shot. A billion, a possible billion-year-old holozoan with differentiated multicellularity. Yes, thank you, Persons Uh Let me see if I can. Who wrote that paper? Um. Right. Oh, by Struther. Yeah, yeah, yep. yeah, yeah. How is this? Yes, year? I do remember this paper. By yeah. Selim Brasieri. Yep. 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 And yep, I yep. thought that was real neat. Yeah, it's really uh, neat. That's um, there's there's just so much of uh, as we talked about earlier the the organisms in the time period when that transition to like animal multicellularity was mm -hmm. going on. There's mm -hmm. like zero fossils, and mm -hmm. so the that's right. Yeah. Um, you know we've got there's like some red algae like Bangiomorpha. About you a billion it. years ago, mm -hmm. um, there's there's a multicellular chlorophyte as well from a billion years old. Yeah. Recently oh yeah, and that's yeah. That is awesome. I uh, I don't remember that paper. Uh, you'll have to eight questions. Uh, well, I mean, I saw I saw most of those. Um, yeah, and so it's um. Yeah, there are a bunch of algae, and then you don't really see things in large numbers showing up until about uh, like 630 million years ago. Mm -hmm. And so then you get your um, Avalon radiation, and then suddenly, you know, the animals are off, off to the mm -hmm. races. But it's yeah. like, what was happening before that point? And there's I know. not a whole lot, sadly. Yes. Yes, yeah, I, I agree. Uh, you kind of wish you had the resolution of the Dushantu fossils it, somewhere in the in the seven hundred billions, uh, yeah, seven hundred millions of years ago, right? Instead yeah, instead of the instead of the mid fives, you know. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but maybe one day, because they found uh, like those those sterines, which may belong to sponges in the cryogenian. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, there's hope, I guess. And with Bicellum brasieri about a billion years ago there there is hope <laughs> but, yeah i mean sterians are pretty they're pretty tough compared to cell level resolution of morphological features right right yeah yeah so uh all right well it has been uh, about an hour all right i don't want to keep you too long i know you're busy no worries yeah yeah, yeah. Um, thanks for having me on this is a lot of fun well thank you for coming on uh thank you for everyone oh there's that paper uh, in the chat and uh, thank you Peter for hosting as always and thank so you. I so we are going to sign off all right thank you take care bye everybody see y'all later <laughs>